So as a young boy, you've heard these stories several times by now, and you're beginning to see an image of what I might have been like for my mom. As a young boy, I had this bad habit of talking back. I had a bit of an attitude problem, and I easily became angered. But who am I kidding? I'm still struggling with anger, and I still have a bit of an attitude. Just last week, I, I about lost my mind when I stepped out of my car and into the parking lot of Home Depot onto a piece of gum. <laughs> gum on the bottom of my shoe. Right or wrong, a few choice words went running through my head. Let's just say God is still working on me, and that's a good thing for all of us. And this is nothing, true, nothing new because the truth is, as a kid, I often had this false sense of entitlement. I was quick to demand justice as if I deserved justice. I was never afraid of a questioning authority figures. And I hate it. I absolutely hated that cliche response that adults would often give because I said so. Anybody guilty of saying that? Anybody ever heard it and it just drove you crazy? Yeah, I can remember when I was a teenager getting into a heated argument with my mom, probably about something petty, and she finally finished the argument with, because I said so. Because I said so, I cried out. What kind of answer is that? It drove me crazy. I demanded that she explain herself. And I remember it so clearly. She smiled and she looked at me and she said, have I not done my job? Is there not a roof over your head? Are you not clothed? Is there not food in your belly? Church, how was I supposed to argue with that? Even as a young boy, I understood that my mom was doing the very best she could to provide for me. She and my dad had worked hard to provide for our family. And I guess you could argue because she took care of me, she had earned the right to say, because I said so. And at the end of the day, she was the adult, and I was the child. And yet this is the exact power struggle the people today's scripture were forced to wrestle with. The people were unhappy with God, and God was ashamed of the people's sinfulness. There's this disagreement between God and, and God's people. So God invites them to bring their case before the mountains, a lawsuit of sorts. The prophet Micah declares, Arise, please your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. And in the midst of this conversation, in the midst of this disagreement, God responds, Oh, my people, oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of slavery. This was God's way of saying, because I said so. And the people, they respond with silence. Their specialness was being called into question. And how are they to argue with God? A few years ago, I came across a commencement speech from an English teacher. He was speaking to a soon-to-be graduating class of 2014. His, his speech went viral. I absolutely love his speech. His punchline is simply, you are not that special. He said, the evidence is everywhere. Numbers even an English teacher cannot ignore. Across the country, no fewer than 3.2 million seniors are graduating from more than 37,000 high schools. He said that's 37,000 valedictorians, that's 37,000 class presidents, that's 92,000 harmonizing altos, that's 340,000 swag-wearing jocks, that's 2,185,967 pairs of Uggs. I don't know what that is, but that's a lot of Uggs. And then he said, why limit yourself to high school? After all, you're getting ready to leave it. So he said, even if you're one in a million, on a planet of 6.8 billion, that means there's nearly 7,000 people just like you. Imagine yourself standing on Washington Street on Marathon Monday and watching 6,800 yous go running by. 
and consider, consider for a moment the bigger picture. Your planet, I'll remind you, is not the center of the solar system. Your solar system is not the center of the galaxy. Your galaxy is not the center of the universe. In fact, astrophysicists assures us the universe has no center. Therefore, you cannot be it. You are not that special. I, I love this speech. You see, because I think we live in a world that has elevated people like you and I to this place of privilege. We are quick to demand of God and even of a society the things we think we deserve, and when we don't get it, we all through often throw a fit. It might even be fair to say that society has failed us. Because let's be real for just a moment. Let's get real honest for just a moment. In the last week, the thing that's made me most angry, in the last week, that the thing that's made me most upset is stepping on a piece of gum in the parking lot of Home Depot. Come on, I'm talking about a piece of gum. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to be reminded that I am, in fact, not the center of the universe. And as frustrating as that gum can be, at least I have shoes to wear. I get it. I get it, especially for us Jesus-loving Christians. This seems counterintuitive because our society, both within the church and outside of the church, has taught us to elevate our self-worth to the highest possible level. But this is a dangerous game to play because when we compete for power and privilege, sometimes we allow our perceived value to diminish the worth of our neighbor, which is in fact the opposite of what God is about. The people in today's Bible story, after being called out by God, they quickly offer, offer stuff as a way of getting right. They went running to the flower store to buy a dozen roses as if that would fix the problem. But that's not how God works. Out of desperation, they sought an appropriate offering in order to respond. But God was not interested in their burnt offerings or their animal sacrifice. God was not interested in the fancy oil or their firstborn child. And we play this game too. But church, God is not interested in perfect attendance on Sunday morning or the dollar amount you place in the offering plate. What God wants is you. You are God's desire, so God wants all of you, not just the part that shows up on Sunday morning. So God makes it clear in response to these people and their failure to live up to, to God's hope for them, God makes things clear. He says, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. This is the requirement of God. But the problem is, two words into God's calling, there's already a struggle. You see, because it's almost impossible for me to preach a sermon about justice without being seen as a political activist. As a preacher, when I even mention the idea of social justice, I'm risking being labeled something I may or may not be. You see, because we have this false sense of specialness, we have allowed our present-day political system to hijack the desires of God. Because when it's a justice issue, it's no longer about justice, but rather a political party. And that's not what God is about. Because God was speaking about justice way before any of us. Just last week, I had somebody in my office, and together we were talking and dreaming about different ministries and missions that we as a church could engage in. This individual, she began to talk to me about this deep conviction that she had. She began to explain to me that her heart was breaking because of the issues at the border. Right or wrong, because of the children with no place to go. She began to share with me her passion and her desire to help, and she did her homework. She did her research. She found that one of our ministry partners in our own denomination, they're responding. Southwest Good Samaritan, it's a refugee center that we as a church have a long history of financially supporting. So when she found out about it, she called the director, Filiberto, and she said, I want to help. What can I do? How can I help? How can my church respond to the children at the border? 
And he said, he said, you know, as strange as it may seem, the need right now is clean underwear. As strange as it may sound, the need is clean underwear. Imagine for a moment, right or wrong, traveling 2,000 plus miles only to be locked away for days, weeks, and months. The need for clean underwear, that does not sound strange to me, and it certainly doesn't sound like a political issue. So please don't hear me speaking on behalf of a Democrat or Republican because I'm not interested in carrying that label. In fact, I think when we make the issue at the border or the issue of gun control a political issue, justice will never be discovered. It's the work of the church. So this lady in my office, as she's talking to me, as she's sharing with me, she said, TJ, do you think we could help? Do you think we could help the children? And my first response was, of course. I said, in fact, we as a church, we're going to do that during the month of October. We're going to collect clean underwear. But then she asked me a question. She asked me a question that, that absolutely broke my heart. She said, TJ, do you think it would be okay to advertise what this underwear is going to be used for? You see, this person, she loves this church so deeply that she was willing to sacrifice her commitment to justice in fear that a political issue might divide us as a faith community. Because our world is so politically charged, we as a church, we often are afraid to bring voice to the things that keep us up at night. And I don't know about you, but I think that's a problem. That if we cannot be a safe space to have meaningful conversations, regardless of your side, I think there's a problem. And I often struggle to know what is right and wrong. I often struggle to know how to respond when I see injustices. But what I do know is it is an injustice when faith communities are afraid to have meaningful conversation. If communities are unwilling to collect clean underwear for children in need, would somebody please tell me, what are we doing? What are we doing? So here's my pledge, church. To be as honest as I possibly know how, I don't know what is right and wrong, and I sure don't know how to fix the issues, regardless of immigration or gun control or anything else you might want to name. But my pledge is this. I pledge to always listen, no judgment. I pledge to work really, really hard to check my political biases at the door. I will commit myself to creating safe spaces to have meaningful conversations. And I have the same expectation for you as a church. If you can't do that, tell me now, because one of us needs to leave. If we cannot have meaningful conversations, let's name that now. But I think you can because you have a history of having meaningful conversations. So we're going to do that tonight at 5, and I imagine our heart will break together. We're going to do that again Wednesday at 6, and I imagine our heart will break together. But the conversations cannot be limited just to safe spaces in this church. There has to be a call to action, and I don't know what that is. Do justice is what God says. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's something we ought to struggle with. I think it's something we as a church should struggle with because if you've noticed, the Spirit of God has been working in this place. If you look around this room just for a moment, there are more people in this space than there were three months ago. And the same is true for our 9 o'clock service. And it's not because of me, it's because the Spirit of God has been stirring up inside of us. And I believe as that Spirit continues to stir, there's going to be a call of action, and we're going to have to be forced to make a decision. Are we going to sit in the pews and be comfortable at Sunday? Or are we going to say yes to the call of justice, regardless of your political position? Are you going to say yes to the children in need of clean underwear? Are you going to say yes to the families whose hearts are breaking 
because of what happened yesterday. Church, the calling of God is clear. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly. I don't know what's waiting for us around the corner, but it's my prayer that we don't screw it up. I don't know what God is calling us to, but it's my prayer that we say yes. Because the pain that this world is facing, I believe we're the answer. I don't know what it looks like. I don't even know how to begin. But I believe that you, that you are the answer. And for us in this moment, it starts with meaningful conversations. Amen.